to be lost and without God and hopeless and helpless and unable to find purpose in life and, and then all of a sudden meeting Jesus and, and, and God coming in and taking them from where they were picking them up out of that miry clay and the mud and the filth of life and hopelessness and depression and discouragement and despondency and, and then putting them on a rock and saying hey I got you you my son I'm taking you where I designed you to go. I've got a plan for you, and I'm going to take you there. And you can't think about that. Because they hadn't been where we've been. Those of us that have been redeemed. Those of us that know what it's like to experience the saving power of a loving God. That recognizes where we were, and then knows where God is taking us to now. So the angels, you know, they were created. They didn't, they weren't, they're not human. They didn't fall into sin as, as we all have done. So that's a neat little phrase, that one little part. And you know, that's in the Bible. And you know, we're doing this year, we're doing our read, pray, and share is our focus for the year. Just get back to the basics of what it means to be a Christian. Just the things, get back to the things that allow us to be able to be who God made us to be and accomplish in this world what God would have us to accomplish. You know, we spent several weeks talking about the importance of reading the Bible. You know, we talked about the authenticity of the Bible. How do we know it's true? How do we know it's not just another book? How do we know it's not just a book of fables? And we talked about the historicity of the Bible and the authenticity of the Bible and the fact that it's been, it can be proven as fact and true and taken with confidence as being completely, wholly, infallible and true. And then I, I encouraged each other to be reading it more. I hope some of you are. I hope some of you are reading your Bible on a more consistent basis, studying that. You know, we're doing the, a lot of us do the one-year Bible this year. Trying to read through the entire Bible in a year. And I do my online. It's called oneyearbibleonline.com. I will have to apologize. We're supposed to have our main reading list out in the Welcome Center. I don't have those today. We'll have those back next week. But some of you are, you know, reading through the list there um, of the, the one-year Bible. I encourage you to do that. And then after talking about the Bible, we went into prayer. And we talked about the power of prayer. And the, the life-transforming opportunity we have to come into the presence of Almighty God through prayer. And then different instances of how prayer should impact our lives. And then how we should be people of, of prayer and the privilege we have in prayer. And the third part of our series on read, pray, and share is what we're talking about today. We're going to begin our series today, six weeks, on sharing your faith. Sharing your faith. Remember you hear a preacher... Talk about share your faith. You immediately think about some type of evangelistic program. Like we're going to go do, you know, I mean, I, I've done, I, I've seen God work through evangelistic programs. A lot of you have. And some of you may have even come to know God through somebody that was doing like evangel evangelism explosion or F-A-I-T-H faith or, you know, four spiritual laws or, you know, something along those lines. That's not what we're talking about in this series on sharing your faith. Now, am I going to encourage you? To be able to talk to somebody about exactly what you believe? Yeah, for sure. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to give you opportunities to plug into systematic training, if you so choose, to get more confident in sharing with somebody what it means to be a Christian. What, what, how, what is your story? How is it that God took you from that miry clay and set your feet on the solid rock? And are you able to explain to them the truths of the gospel of God being holy, man being a sinner, separation from God, and, and talking about how, do we, how does God span that gap between Him being holy and us being sinners, us deserving hell, the power of you know, sin, and then how God sent Jesus. Can you explain to somebody clearly how they can come to know Christ, how they can become a Christian? And we're going to have classes and different things we're going to do to help with that. But that's not the gist of this next six weeks talking about sharing your faith. What we're going to be talking about is sharing our story. Sharing what God has done in your life. Um, you know, Pastor Dwayne's come on board and has really pressed us as a staff to be engaged in finding what he calls, where have you seen Jesus lately? And where have you seen Jesus? And so we, we are looking and, and we, we share with each other about how we've seen Jesus, how we've seen God, how we've seen something happen in life that we know without a doubt God did that. Man, God did that thing. 
Man, I saw God at work in the world around me, in my life, in my little circle of influence. I saw the God of creation do something crazy, amazing, powerful, transforming. And so part of what we're going to be talking about is looking for those Jesus moments as a church and sharing those together as we see God, because God is alive. You know, I had Easter a few weeks ago. Celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. Well, he's still alive. Okay? And so, and as he's alive, as he's working, as he's here in this world doing mighty things, we want to celebrate some of those things. But we're going to talk this morning specifically about introducing, we're going to talk about our story. We're going to talk about my story, your story, and then his story, and then our story, and how do we get out there and impact other people to where they've got a Jesus story. And I'm going to share with you in the Bible. In the Bible, there's a, a guy who Jesus told he needed to share his story. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark is in the New Testament, so it's in the back part of the Bible. It's the second book of the New Testament. One of the books of the Bible called the Gospels, which is where these men were recording accounts of Jesus' life. The second one of those books, the first one's called Matthew. So you find Matthew, go a little bit past Matthew, you come to a book called Mark. And it'll be up on the screen as well. We're in Mark chapter 5. It's a pretty familiar passage. If you've been in church very long, you've probably read this. If you went to Sunday school as a child, you probably remember this kind of a scary story. A little bit of a scary story. But most people know this story. But we're going to pick up on Mark chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 14. So this is Mark chapter 5, verse 14. I'm going to read a few verses here for you. It says, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit it, but said to him, this is our, where we're going to camp out here today, okay? This is our, our take home point. This is Jesus talking to this man who he had delivered. He said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and begged and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Everyone marveled. That's what I want us to focus on a little bit too. Everyone marveled. Now, the, the, most of you know what happened here, right? Jesus had been preaching. Gets in a boat with his disciples. They go across the sea and they get to a, a place. They get out of the boat. They get out of the boat and all of a sudden, Matthew tells us there were two demon-possessed men. And Mark and Luke talked about this one in particular. So these, these guys come up and they're demon possessed. They come out of the tombs. They were living out in the tombs. And as, they, as the boat came in, these demon possessed men came running up to Jesus. Came running, demon possessed now. And it said, it says clearly in Matthew, and even in this first part of Mark that we didn't read, that these guys were demon possessed to the point where they had tried to restrain them. They tried to tie them up and break ropes. It said they even took chains and tried to chain their hands and their feet together because these demon possessed men were cutting themselves and, and they were just, the demons were destroying them. And it says that they, the chains couldn't even hold them. That every time they would chain them, they would break these chains. So now Jesus, you can imagine Jesus and the disciples together. Oh, step up, I'm starting to see these crazy demonic men come running out. And what do these, what does this demonic man say? I'm going to read what it says in. Luke. I'm going to read it kind of like how I think it said. It says so. This is Luke chapter 8, um, verse 28. It says, When he saw Jesus talking about the demonic man, the man who was possessed by demons, you know, people really do get possessed by demons. You know, we don't talk about that a lot in church, but people really do get possessed by demons. They, they did back then and they still do today. You know, people, there are actually demons in the world. And sometimes if the Holy Spirit is not living inside of you, if, if God is not living inside of you, then sometimes demons come to possess people. Now, most of the people in your circle of influence are not possessed by demons. Most people around you that you think, they must be possessed by a demon. 
they're probably not, just because you don't like them, just because they get on your nerves, that is not criteria for claiming they're demon possessed to start calling up somebody to exercise the demon. But it does happen, and it happened right here. And these guys, this guy, so it says, when he saw Jesus come up the demoniac man, he cried out and fell at his feet. Now listen to this part. Shouting at the top of his voice, this is in Luke, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And he says, I beg you, don't torture me. Man, how crazy you think that was? You think the disciples were thinking. I mean, because Jesus had already been doing miracles. The disciples have seen Jesus do miracles. This is still early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus gets out of the boat with the disciples. All of a sudden, they see these demoniac crazy men coming. Probably not clothed, cutting themselves, bleeding. Hadn't been shaved, and I'm sure in a while. Broken chains maybe hanging off of them. They come running down to Jesus and they follow you speak and start yelling. It says at the top of his voice he yelled, What do you want with me? And he begged him, Don't torture me. And Matthew it even says, Are you here to torture us? What does it say? Before the appointed time? There's a lot of theology we could take into that. Of you know, people say, when I talk to them about Jesus, and I'm trying to find out. If you come to a place in your life where you know you are in that miry clay and you are going towards those things in life that are self-serving and serving yourself and just caught up in sin, have you, have you come to a place where Jesus has stepped in and changed your life and converted you and you are a new creature and you have a relationship to God? And I'm talking to people about that. A lot of times people say, oh, I believe in Jesus. They believe they're okay. Why? Because they believe in Jesus. They believe if they believe in Jesus and believe that he was the Son of God, believe that he died on the cross, believe that he was raised from the dead, believe, you know, just believe in their mind all those facts are true, then they have peace with God. I mean, I tell you, you know this demoniac guy? You know these demons in this demon possessed man? You know what they believe? They believe Jesus was the Son of God. They knew what was going to happen. They knew that their days were numbered. But yet, did they? Or they have a right relationship with God? No, because it was the knowledge about Jesus is not what we're talking about, that song of the redeemed. It's actually having a relationship. Your story that we're going to talk about this morning can't be a story of how much you believe facts about Jesus. Your story has to be about what, just like what this guy said. So these demons come up in there. They're yelling, Jesus, don't torture us. They said, don't send us out of this region. Jesus, what's your name?